In the several months that I had shared the Baker Street lodgings with Sherlock Holmes, I was consistently amazed by the indefatigable energy he poured into his never-ending war on crime. But my physician's eye could see the strain that perhaps another wouldn't have noticed. Thus it was one morning that I prevailed upon him to join me for a day in the country. All seemed tranquil at first, but I was to learn, as I did in later years, that when Sherlock Holmes did not seek trouble, it often sought him. Help her. They may be coming. Steady now. We'll have you all right in a minute. What's happened to the young lady? Who are you running from? Stark. Carol. They tried to kill me. Out now, Holmes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we'd better get them to London, eh? My very thought. The young lady is uninjured, but she's suffering from a deep state of shock. Come along. Oh. Yes, Annie, sir. Twice last night she saved my life. Who is she? I don't know. We only met last night. I'm afraid she's mute. What? Deaf mute? No, she hears and understands perfectly. How did you meet her? Well, it all started yesterday afternoon. Seems an eternity since then. I was in my office facing the realities of my professional situation. I suppose that everyone finds his first venture into independent business to be a dreary experience. After a year of it, I'd about decided to admit failure and seek employment with some recognized firm. It was at that point that I received a client. Mr. Hadley? His name was Colonel Lysander Stark. Had I known then what horror he was bringing into my life, I would have strangled him right then and there. Frankly, Mr. Hadley, the commission I have come here to offer you deals with a matter of extreme secrecy. I have come to some lengths to acquaint myself with both your professional and your personal qualifications. Personal qualifications, sir? Yes. I know you to be an efficient hydraulic engineer, but also that you are a bachelor, an orphan, and that you reside here alone in London. Why, that's very true, but I'm afraid I don't understand. You shall when I explain the assignment. Do I have your word that our conversation will go no further than this room? Of course, sir. I shall respect your confidence. Excellent. Well, then. Does 50 pounds for a night's work appeal to you? 50 pounds? I note by your expression that you suspect some illegality. Let me set your mind at rest on that score. Exactly what you want me to do? To repair a hydraulic press, Mr. Hatherley. A rather large hydraulic press. Well, that hardly seems unusual. For some years, I have owned a small place in the country just outside London. Recently, it has come to my attention that the land contains a vein of something commonly called Fuller's Earth. I trust you are familiar with the term. But ore is dug out of the earth. Why should you need an hydraulic press? <laughs> I'm a businessman, Mr. Hadley. Undoubtedly, the land surrounding mine contains more of such wealth. I hope to use the income from my own discovery to purchase my neighbor's land cheaply before he discovers its hidden wealth. I see. If my neighbor were to suspect what wealth he treads on daily, he would never sell at any price. It's quite clear now. 
You use the press to mold the dark earth into some innocent form uh, so that you can dispose of it without suspicion. Precisely. Very ingenious. There's a fortune down there. A fo Is there anything wrong? What is it, Colonel Stark? Can I get you something? I trust in you, Mr. Hatherley. Do you accept the commission? When do I begin, sir? I promised to meet him that night, last night, at Aford Station. The time he suggested was quite late, 11.30, but he insisted that it would be less conspicuous. I freely admit that the money kept me from exercising a more natural curiosity at such bizarre proceedings. One point, sir. When we encountered you, admittedly you were in a highly nervous state, but you kept repeating that they were after you. Did this man Stark have a confederate? Yes, a foreigner, a man named Carroll. I was to meet him later that night. Go on. Last night I boarded the train to Aford and arrived there a little past eleven as ordered. Mm -hmm. And Colonel Stark was waiting? He was. We drove for almost an hour. And then we stopped suddenly, and he almost pulled me into a darkened house. Stark muttered under his breath as he fumbled to strike a match. But suddenly a light appeared at the top of the stairs. It was the first time I saw this young woman, gentlemen. Even in the poor light, beauty and fear were sharp in her face. How do you do, miss? She cannot answer you, I'm afraid. She is quite mute. I forgot to tell you that I have a colleague, Monsieur Carroll, brilliant mineralogist. I'll fetch him for you, if you'll excuse me for a moment. By all means. trying to warn me against Colonel Stark. But why should I fear Colonel Stark? I, I only met him this afternoon. My friend and associate, Monsieur Carroll. A pleasure, sir. Colonel Stark will show you our press and explain the difficulties we have. I'll join you in a moment. After I have arranged with our housekeeper for you stay tonight. Yes, yes, that's a good idea. Will you come this way, Mr. Hatherley?
I thought you have learned better, my dear. Perhaps I'll have to send you back to school. Yes, in principle, this is the standard hydraulic press. Though I must say, I've seen few as large. Indeed. And so it has to work for four ordinary presses. I think I told you that time is my greatest foe. Would you bring more light, please? Wood. Concrete would have given you more support. Are these walls reinforced from the outside? Ah, uh, Bruno. I was just about to explain to Mr. Hatherley that all the walls, except the one he is examining, are reinforced. However, there's no trouble with the walls. It's in the machinery. You'll hear it. Good. I just wanted to check up first. fluid cutting down your power. Turn it off and we'll have a look at the driving rods. I knew what I was after and the rest proved to be no problem. Of course. You knew by then the true purpose of the press. Not quite. Although I was sure it was not for making dirt brick molds. Much too large for that. But they'd lied to me so blatantly, I thought it best not to call them on it right off. Well, what were they using the press for? Fairly obvious. They are counterfeiters. They use the press to form the amalgam that takes the place of silver. So I learned during the night. It was naive of me to assume that everyone but myself was asleep. But I did. Well again, Mr. Hazley. better than myself what that sound meant. Caro had started the press. Within minutes, that cold ceiling would be down with a force capable of grinding me to a shapeless pulp. And there was no way in the world I could stop it.
You will come with me. What's happened here? Bruno! That's almost the last lucid recollection I have. I remember carrying her outside and plunging her head into the darkness. Then you have no memory of going through the woods? Almost none. The next thing I remember, you and Dr. Watson were bending over me. Are you all right? She screamed, did you hear her? Yes, quite clearly. Gentlemen? Yes, Mr. Hatherley. Oh, you can speak. Oh, why last night did you pretend? I wasn't pretending. I've been unable to speak for a year. Excuse me, Miss... Um... Connors. Ruth Connors. Uh, Miss Connors, I gather that the events of last night gave you a shock, rather like a shock you received a year ago. Yes. When I saw the gun in Colonel Stark's hand, and it was pointed directly at me, a year ago, another young man visited us to fix the hydraulic press. I see. What do you know about this other young man? I was standing there, watching, when all of a sudden Colonel Stark fired his gun straight into the other young man's face. Why didn't you go to the police? I did. But first, I must tell you that Mr. Carew is my uncle and guardian. He's my only living relation. And when I witnessed the murder, he fell upon me, repeating over and over, you must never say a word, you must never say a word. But the first opportunity I had, I ran to the police. But what did they do? Nothing. Because from that moment to this, I've been unable to utter a sound or speak a word. It was as though my throat was frozen up. Incredible. I have heard of this before. The worst of it was, my uncle learned of my attempt to inform on him and had me committed to Bedlam. The insane asylum? I spent six long months there, six horrible, unforgettable months before they released me in his custody. After that, he forced me to do his bidding by threatening to send me back. Send me back to school was the expression he used. Why, that's horrible. Very. And I think it's time we called in our old friend, Inspector Lestrade. If only to deal with this man, Carrow. You're not forgetting Stark, are you? Oh, I expect we will find his remains, Watson. The loss of his medicine undoubtedly saved England the cost of executing him. Well, come along.
Now that young Mr. Hatherley tells us about neglecting the candle while he made his escape, I can place the blame for the fire. You sure it was Colonel Lysander Stark whose remains you found here? No doubt. Several articles of authentic identification, no doubt. Nothing else? No, Inspector. Sorry. All right, thank you, Constable. Now where's Holmes got himself to? He just went down to the station. He said he'd be back any minute. Look here, if Holmes thinks he can do... I'm sorry to keep you all waiting. Well, everything's settled, Lestrade. About as settled as it's likely to be. Stark's dead. Carrow's escaped. The only thing now is to go back to London and put out an alarm for him. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, tell me, uh, what about the money? What money? Well, you know, the money they were making, the counterfeit. Have you found any? Well, well, no. Oh, I suppose Carrow took it with him. Well, the man would have to be pretty desperate indeed to even bother with real money, let alone counterfeit. What are you suggesting, Holmes? Miss Connors. The only carriage used here is the carriage that Mr. Hatherley rode in, is that right? Why, yes, I think so. I see. And that carriage has been in the livery stable since last night. Thanks to an obliging constable, I found one of Mr. Carrow's footprints. But there was no trail of similar prints leading away from the house. Mark you, I didn't imagine that he would try and make his escape on foot. How did he get away, then? He didn't, my dear fellow. He's still in his house, hiding somewhere. What? Mr. Holmes, there's a cellar where... I examined that cellar myself. No, I mean the special cave they dug under the house to hide the money. Then there must be an entrance from the house itself. Well, I wasn't permitted to know exactly where, but I'm sure it was in this room somewhere. Thank you. Well, let's try and see, shall we? I beg your pardon. Mm-hmm. What have we got here? Watson. Oh, there wasn't anything to it. Now then, what have we got here? Oh, just nick me, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Nothing serious. Well, we'll have a look at it anyway. Come on. So you may lend a hand in here. That's that. I don't believe you'll have any more trouble with Mr. Carew. This has been a nasty business all round. Mm. I've lost my 50 pound fee, been roughed up. But it could have been worse, I suppose. A good deal worse, my friend. For example, uh, I believe this is yours. Mine. Yes. What is it? Your shoe, I believe. I recovered it from the press. Yes, it makes one think, doesn't it? Well, Watson, you were quite right. A day in the country can be quite relaxing. <laughs>